Gentlemen, a very good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Charles. For those of you who are from outside our institution, I'm the Director of Communications here at the EBRD. Uh, a very warm welcome to you for the launch of the Transition Report 2013. Uh, stuck in transition is the question mark. Uh, and that's what we're going to be debating over the next uh, hour or so. What needs to be done, what's really happening in our countries of operations, and what can be done to bring about uh, movement and progress. And the title really tells its own story, that some of our countries may well be stuck in transition. Uh, I'll be introducing our panel in a few minutes. When the Iron Curtain was falling uh, across uh, Eastern Europe in 1989, and then, of course, followed by the collapse of the Soviet Union, I was lucky to have a, a ringside seat of that history, or perhaps the end of history, uh, as uh, Francis Fukuyama put it, during that period, able to see what was going on in those countries, uh, my previous job as a BBC correspondent. And people told me all the time there, wherever I went, the question was always the same. I always said, how long will it take you, do you think, to become like the countries of Western Europe? How long will it take you to make political and economic progress like that? And it didn't matter where I went, whether it was Central Europe, whether it was uh, in parts of the former uh, Soviet uh, East. The answer was always the same. We think it'll take about a decade, and then we'll be like Western Europe. We'll have made that progress. And if things go really badly, maybe it'll take two decades, but no more than that. Well, as we now know, that was hopelessly optimistic in some cases. In some areas, there has been progress. In others, they really are stuck in transition. In a short while, the EBRD's chief economist, Eric Bergloff, will be explaining the thoughts in this year's transition report in some detail. But first, let me introduce you to our honoured guests here today. Uh, first of all, Eddie Rama is the recently elected Prime Minister of Albania. Uh, he's had many years in Albanian politics, uh, and we're very grateful for his attendance here today. Rosa Otunbayeva is the former president of the Kyrgyz Republic, and I think I'm right in saying probably the only president in that region to have handed over power uh, peacefully and democratically. Is that right, I think, in Central Asia? I would guess. There's <laughs> a claim to fame. George Soros, a uh, global investor and philanthropist, and a very keen uh, follower, of course, and activist in the question of uh, democratic development and civil society development. Very glad to have him here today. And Tarek Youssef, a member of the board of directors of the Central Bank of Libya. And also on the stage, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, the Deputy Chief Economist, one of the authors of this report, uh, a man who's put in many hours into examining this issue. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to invite the President of the EBRD, Sasuma Chakrabarti, to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Well, Excellencies, uh, guests, colleagues, welcome. Welcome to the launch of this year's EBRD Transition Report. Now, it's my particular pleasure to welcome a panel, as Jonathan said, of very distinguished speakers that have played and still play a very central role in shaping the process of transition to democracy and markets in their own countries and beyond. And I'm particularly grateful to all of you uh, for making it to London today, in spite of your many duties and busy schedules, to kick off what I believe will be a very important discussion. Now, it won't surprise you to hear me say that the EBRD takes its transition reports very seriously indeed. But this one, in my view, really occupies a special place in our history. Our history, of course, by and large, coincides with the history of the transition to democracy and markets. This report takes a broad, bird's eye view of the process of transition, focusing on the last 15 years, but also on the prospects for growth and income convergence in the next three decades. This year's transition report straddles the boundaries between economics and politics. Now, in my view, this stance is necessary to understand transition and economic development more broadly. The link between economics and politics is also explicitly recognized in our founding charter, and we're mindful of this in our operations. So a failure to acknowledge the political conditions under which economic reforms take place can often cause well-meaning reform attempts to founder. Now, as an institution that's tasked with promoting market-based reform, the EBRD can't really just be content with simply calling for or recommending specific changes. We've also got to understand why countries often have difficulties implementing reform and how these constraints can either be relaxed or removed. So that, in one line, is the purpose of this year's transition report. 
Now, it's not my role here today to summarize what's in the report. Um, there are better people here on the stage to do that. But let me give you a personal view on it and also say why I think it really matters for our institution. The 2013 transition report begins, I think you'll see, rather bleakly. The basic message is that, with important exceptions, transition has essentially been flatlining since the mid-2000s and has been worsened by the financial crisis. But this stagnation is not solely a result of the crisis. Rather, we believe, it's a trend that has become recognizable now as the dust of the crisis has begun to settle. The stagnation of transition is, of course, deeply worrying for two reasons. First, it affects a very large set of countries that simply cannot afford to become stuck in transition. They're really a long way still from the transition frontier. As the report shows, if these economies become stuck, their living standards will not begin to approach those in advanced economies over the next half century. Now, the other worrying fact is that in some countries, reform has not just stalled, but has in fact gone into reverse, at least in certain sectors. This includes some advanced uh, transition economies that have been shining lights of reform in past years. And some of these reform reversals have been driven by populist policies that were in turn a response to social strains during and after the crisis. Now, countries, of course, must address these strains, but there are other ways of doing so. In this regard, equality of opportunity, inclusive institutions are really of very great importance. And this is an area to which the EBRD can contribute. We've recently expanded our criteria for project selection and design to become more effective in this area. So for the EBRD, I should also say as its president, this report poses major challenges. We often take credit for having been part of the incredible success story of transition, dating from the fall of the Berlin Wall right the way through to the mid-2000s. Now, if we do this, if we take this credit, should we, shouldn't we also share some responsibility for the subsequent stagnation or transition. Of course, we're a small player in the overall scheme of things. But we also like to think of ourselves as a rather important catalyst, important coordinator of change. We like to think that we made a significant contribution, and I think we did, to containing the 2008-09 crisis, helping to protect transition in tur turbulent times. Now, fortunately, the report reassures us on one aspect that's been absolutely central to our role. Economic integration is indeed the key to bolstering reform and supporting improvements in institutions and human capital. Now, this works through many, many channels, including trade, foreign direct investment, cross-border banking. Now, all of these have been vital to our business model for many years. International integration can be and should be a robust motor of transition. It works in all geographies and in many political environments. Finally, the transition report confirms the complementarity of economic reform on the one hand and targeted political and governance reforms on the other. The latter includes, in particular, the quest for transparency and accountability. And this is an area where I believe the EBRD can and should do more, and in which we have begun to take steps in, in partnership with political leaders in our region and in coordination with other key international stakeholders. We're calling this our Investment Climate and Good Governance Initiative, and I'm happy to say that Albania, under the leadership of Prime Minister Rama, will be among our first partners in this endeavour. We knew, of course, that transition would never be easy. The process is having a mixed start now in some of the Arab countries that we just started working in. But it wasn't exactly a seamless process in most of our countries of operations in the early 1990s. However, I do think after the early 1990s, the transition process enjoyed a very long stretch of success. And as the EBRD begins its discussions with shareholders about the bank's strategic direction for the years to come, the main challenge will be to revive that success, to revive it, particularly in countries that still have a long way to go. My hope today is that the discussion will help us define the critical themes with which our countries and all of us here must engage if we're going to make this happen. Thank you very much.
Sumo, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I should tell you, this is also being watched outside the building. By the way, we are live streaming this event. And if anybody is following us on Twitter, there is a hashtag, which is uh, EBRDTR. So uh, a lot of people following us outside the event. Eric, perhaps I could ask you now to elucidate some of the ideas uh, in this report. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, welcome again to this year's uh, transition report launch. It's great to see so many people here. But it's truly an honor for us to have this extraordinary panel of leaders here. All of them have, um, in their own right, contributed to transition. Uh, they are true heroes of um, transition in, in, in my world. I, I won't spend time introducing them now, but um, I think you will hear that they have a, a lot to add to what is being said uh, in this uh, report. We are also very honored to have here today a high-level delegation for, from Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar is the most recent uh, transition economy in the world. They are here in Europe uh, on a trip actually sponsored by George Soros to learn about uh, the transition and development experience in, in Europe. Of course, George Soros has been an important promoter of the issues that we're trying to address in this report, democracy and uh, economic reform. I also want to use this opportunity to thank um, Dermin Settlemeyer, who has led the work um, on the report. He has been, it's been a truly collaborative effort involving many different parts of the, of the bank, uh, particularly Alan Russo and his team of, of political councillors have, have been deeply involved. So uh, choosing the cover of the transition report is always the most difficult thing in producing the report. Uh, this year's theme is stuck in transition. And we found this image um, of a man looking out of the back of a window of a yellow bus. We don't have much information about him or about his uh, predicament. Maybe he's stuck in one of the many backed up border crossings of the region, or perhaps in stuck in traffic in one of the increasingly congested capital cities in our region, or perhaps the bus has just run out of gas. We imagine him, like so many of our countries, uh, stuck in transition. Over the last decade, after all the remarkable achievements in the 1990s, very little has happened in terms of economic reforms in, the most, in most of the countries where EBD operate. The report is about understanding why countries are stuck and what can be done to get the process of reform going again. Like the man in the bus, we are looking back, back at the transition experience to date. We want to understand the interplay between political and economic institutions, how lack of democracy slows down economic reform and ultimately economic growth, and how economic reforms can help build support for democracy in the long run. We show how countries can break out of these transition traps by opening up, by encouraging exper experimentation and accountability at the local and regional levels, and by investing in people giving them more education, and establishing an institutional context where their skills are made better use of. But let me make one brief remark here before I continue. We understand, of course, that what we are asking for is not easy. And in fact, it's our point of what we are saying. Economic reforms, political reforms are very difficult. And uh, this is the challenge of the heroes of transition, the reformers. And, and this report is very much dedicated to their efforts. And of course, their efforts have not been made easier by what happened in the West, by the global financial crisis, by the disagreements within the European Union. The European Union has been such an important engine of um, convergence in the region. Their the, the the lack of um, agreement on fundamental issues, the stalling of the European project have certainly had very important effects uh, in, in our region. 
It's, of course, much easier to sit on the sidelines and opine on what countries are doing and, and not doing. But that's our mandate, uh, to monitor reforms. And we don't just sit on the sidelines. We do work with governments and investors to push reforms forward. If you ever doubted the premise of this, just small detail. Let's try this one instead. Uh, that much better. So if you ever doubted the premise of, of this report, here is the slide that uh, shows what we have been talking about. It's the quintessential transition report slide. It shows progress in reforms as we measure them with our transition indicators. <coughs> in the 1990s, it was difficult to keep track of, of all the changes. Profound transformation was happening on a scale and at a speed never seen before in history. These reforms required great courage from leaders and sacrifice from the public. But from the very beginning, it was clear that reform was not happening everywhere. And the pace differed uh, across countries. Now our work to keep track of reforms has, has become easier. But over the last decades, reform have come to a grinding halt in most countries in the EBRD region. In some cases, like most countries in Central Europe and the Baltics, transition has stalled at an advanced level after rapid and, and highly successful reforms. What remains are some very difficult measures in sensitive and heavily regulated sectors like healthcare and the energy sector. But unfortunately, we're also seeing some signs of um, reversals in reforms in, in these countries. Promises to pens pensioners are being reneged on, price controls are coming back into fashion, mostly in the energy sector. But more worrying is the fact that even in countries that have not come at, at all as far as Central and Eastern Europe, where reform, uh, we see this stagnation in reforms. We see this in the Ukraine, where pop the population has gone through so, many hard so much hardship and so many false dawns. And in the last, thank you very much. And in the last decade, very little has happened in terms of reform. For example, the critical reforms in the non-transparent gas ma monopoly have not happened despite repeated promises and strong pressures from the international financial institutions and the European Union. In Moldova, one of the poorest countries in our region, reforms have also st stumbled over several, uh, after several promising starts. The formers are up against considerable odds to take on vested interest, some of which are trying to take control of the larger banks and intimidating regulators, supervisors, and courts to let them do so. In the Kyrgyz Republic, where one of our special guests today, the former president, Rosa Otambayeva, has played and still plays a key role in building democracy, we see the uncertainty uh, for investors, the uh, discussions and, and uh, demonstrations around the, the Kumtur gold mine. This is affecting uh, foreign as well as uh, domestic investors. The only sub-region among our countries of operations where we're seeing continued reforms is South East Europe. Albania, our guest here today, the newly elected Prime Minister Rama, and his young team are embarking on an ambitious reform program on fundamentally changing the growth model of the country and addressing some of the deep-rooted uh, governance problems in the country. And much is at stake. The European Council is considering giving Albania EU candidate status uh, in recognition of, of its efforts. The international financial institutions can, in this situation, only help. This is a process that must be owned by Prime Minister Rama uh, and his team, and ultimately, of course, by the Albanian people. So, so why do we care so much about reforms? After all, they are risky, they involve pain, sacrifice for people. Well, we have examples of what happens to countries that sla slacken in, in their reform efforts. 
I would use uh, uh, Slovenia here, one of the richest countries in the region and a Euro mem Eurozone member since uh, 2007. The current government under Alenka Bratusek is committed to cleaning up the country's domestic banks, to restructuring the excessively close and, and unhealthy relationships between banks and corporations and between the banks and the government. Many transition reports have pointed to the lack of privatization and weak corporate governance in Slovenia. Now we want to help the new government to implement these difficult reforms. But reforms do not only help reduce the country's vulnerability to financial crisis. Reforms are first and foremost about economic growth and long-term convergence with Western Europe in living standards and well-being. The aspirations of convergence has been the driving force of so many of the profound changes we have seen over the last 25 years and is the key to long-term stability and prosperity in Europe. Let me show you a slide that illust hopefully illustrates this process and points to it, what is at stake. Let's, for a moment, uh, go back to the early 1990s. Take all our countries of operation in, in, in our traditional region, order them according to the per capita income in 1990. And then on the horizontal axis, you have growth since uh, 1990. <coughs> at the top, you see the richest country, Slovenia. At the bottom, you see the poorest uh, country in, in the region, Uzbekistan. And in honor of our special guest today, Prime Minister Rama, we will follow Albania particularly. So here, we're playing forward. So stopping at the 94, we see this initial recession in almost all countries, so growth uh, decreased compared to 1990. And in, by the time of 94, Albania had already turned the corner, so on its way out of the transitional recession. Poland has actually just gone over the, the level it had uh, before transition started. Let us play out, let's watch Albania go towards the upper right-hand corner. And the blue line you see up there is the EU 15 average. It's moving away from, but you see countries are still coming closer. And Albania is going up. And now it's almost catching up with Poland. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> but you see here the... Uh, remarkable transition that uh, Albania has gone through, it has come closer to the blue line and it has, so it has converged. And of course, this is a process that we are concerned about uh, will not um, be continued. We also see that th there's still very large income gaps comparing uh, individual countries to the, to the blue line. But you see also some countries like Serbia and Ukraine actually has not reached the levels of income it had before transition. Of course, this is, if we believe the official statistics, but it does reflect uh, something. For, the, for these countries and the richer cousins elsewhere in Eastern Europe, there's an issue how long it will take or whether they will ever catch up with Western Europe at the current pace and without additional reform. So in the report, we look back at growth in the past, and based on that, an international experience, we project growth into the future. Our conclusion is that countries, if they remain stuck in transition, that's, that's if, if they don't change economic and political institutions, they can risk of prolonging this process of convergence by decades. So what can countries do to jumpstart the process? To say something about this question, we look at three key areas of, of reform. We look at uh, the political reform. We look at uh, lo the, what can be done to address the low quality of human capital, what can be done to uh, deal with uh, insufficiently inclusive reforms. And this sh short presentation, uh, it will not be possible for me to do justice to the full report, of course, but 
I'm going to focus on the interaction between political and economic institutions and mention the links to the other topics of the report, human capital and economic inclusion. So here is perhaps the most fundamental slide in the report. It shows the correlation between democracy and economic transition. The horizontal axis measures the degree of democracy as defined by the most widely accepted measure, the so-called Polity 2 index. The vertical axis measures economic transition using the EBRD country level transition indicators, which are our measure of cumulative market reforms. The first thing that stands out from this picture is that political and economic institutions are indeed correlated. So countries with weak democracy also have weak market institutions, and lively democracies are more likely to have good economic institutions. In, in the report, we show also that there is a strong causal link from political institutions to economic institutions. Political institutions do not change very easily. In fact, most countries have kept roughly the same level of democracy that they acquired in the early 1990s. However, we also show that an impact in the other uh, direction as well. Over time, economic reforms tend to strengthen political institutions. In particular, they make it less likely that countries will, which have reached a certain level of democracy will slide back into less democratic forms of government. The second observation from this chart is that even though political institutions are important for the quality of economic institutions, they're not all that matters. Countries like Kazakhstan and Belarus, for example, at the, low, at the lower part of uh, levels of democracy, there is a very significant difference in terms of uh, the quality of economic institutions. Belarus has had rather limited genuine economic uh, transition, whereas Kazakhstan had undertaken significant reforms and done a great deal to improve the quality of its economic institutions. You can also observe significant variation in the quality of economic institutions across countries with strong democracies. So in the report, we exploit this variation. More specifically, we ask the question, suppose that political institutions are given, or at least very hard to change, what can reform-minded governments do to improve their economic institutions? Our analysis points to three key important measures that can help countries break out of their political transition traps. The first measure is about, is about um, open up the economy to trade and financial integration. Of course, here the causality goes two ways. Countries with better economic institutions are more likely to open up. But it's also strong evidence that opening up your economy spurs economic reform and makes economic reforms more resilient to domestic political pressures. The most striking example is, of course, the virtuous circle uh, of uh, EU accession. And again, going back to what I said earlier, the fact that the EU is so troubled is weakening uh, this um, impact uh, on, uh, on our region, this very positive impact that EU accession has had. And if we look now at the situation in Ukraine, even if Ukraine does not, in any foreseeable future, has the option of EU membership, uh, EU an EU um, agreement, uh, association agreement, could help the government send signals about the direction of travel and could be an encouragement to, to reformers. This slide here shows the relative impact of um, the different factors determining whether the, best, the difference between the countries with strong economic institutions and those with weak economic institutions. And um, you can see that openness and trade is a very important factor and, and with trade and financial integration bear, be having about the same relative impact. But also uh, the quality of political institutions and in this uh, data also, of course, EU membership factors that are beyond the control of policymakers like geography, history, and ethnicity seem to play a minor role in this. Our second measure, or second way to get out of uh, 
traps in transition with given political institutions is by through political and administrative reform at the local and regional levels. This is often politically feasible even in countries where institutions are stuck at the national level. Building on earlier research, the transition report shows that there are, is remarkable variation in the quality of institutions across regions and municipalities in a given country. Hence, there must be scope to improve regional and local institutions, bringing them up to the best practice within the country. The prime example here is probably Russia. <coughs> when we ask managers in our regular Be BEEPS enterprise survey about the quality of economic institutions, the variation in responses uh, across Russian regions is remarkable. Th this slide illustrates this using the answer to a particular question about corruption, according to managers, to what extent is corruption a business obstacle or one of the three most important business obstacles in, in Russian regions. And you can see that there is uh, you know, a lot of, of variation from corruption being the most important and corruption being uh, much less important. And there's very interesting research by um, two Russian researchers, Yekaterina Zhuravskaya and Alexander Yakovlev. They found evidence that regions with more political competition, more transparent government, and better media are better at implementing these reforms. So even though you have reforms implementing at the national level, it doesn't mean necessarily that they uh, are Im implemented at the, at the regional or local levels. And we also saw that the quality of local institutions mattered the, how serious the impact of the global financial crisis was. And as you know, Russia did have a very serious uh, impact uh, from the global financial crisis. So allowing and even fostering institutional competition among regional and local governments can help speed up reforms. And working with reform-oriented regional governments is, is important. Empowering consumers and end users of public goods like water and power utilities can also help improve the quality of political and economic institutions locally. We have seen many examples of how such grassroots mobilization can help push change and enrich the public debate. The third and final measure that I will mention is investing in people, in their human capital. In the economic literature, there is an intense debate between those who see institutions as a key explanation to why nations succeed or fail, and those who link it to, or think it's all about human capital. There's no time to do justice to the different position in this debate, and we do not want to take a strong stance ourselves. However, one general finding that is corroborated by our report is that better institutions and better human capital reinforce each other. In particular, we find a positive correlation between the quality of institutions and the return to investments in higher education. The latter, in turn, is critical to persuade people to pursue higher education and also to reduce brain drain, to retain people and, and attract them back. Kazakhstan has very effectively fostered this positively reinforcing interaction between institutions and human capital. As the leader, leadership of Kazakhstan has tried to implement economic reforms domestically, it has also invested strongly in sending young talent abroad for training, <coughs> most famously through the so-called Balashak or Future Scholarships. I believe there are some Balashak scholars uh, in the room today, and we have had the pleasure of having some of them in, in our office. The value of what you learn abroad will be greater at home the more government has done to reform the economic institution in your country. In the meantime, the government is also building an ambitious new university to perhaps receive some of you back to train the next generation of Kazakh leaders in business and in government. The final contribution of the report that I would like to mention is an analysis of the extent to which institutions in our region are inclusive. Inclusive for us means getting as close to pos as possible to the equality of opportunity. That is, delinking, delinking the success in life from factors that individuals have no control over, like their social background, place of birth, or, or gender. The report shows that economic inclusion measured by this standard, varies widely across countries in our region with particular problems in some 
Southeastern European countries and some countries in the southern and eastern Mediterranean and Central Asia. This is significant not only because the inherent unfairness in inequality of opportunity, but because it reduces the incentives to invest, to reform, and to grow. This slide shows, um, sorry, I, I just in one more. So this slide shows the, um, the uh, question, uh, which is the most important factor to succeed uh, in life in our country. And the red shows um, uh, the average inequality of opportunity for people who answered uh, the more unequal of the opportunity were, the more you thought that political connections matter. Or, so again, there is a strong connection between inequality of opportunity and uh, the incentives, the perceptions uh, are in society. So let me summarize. Much of our region is stuck in transition, in a vicious circle of weak political institutions and lack of economic reforms. There are ways to break out of this vicious cycle and instead create a virtuous circle of political and economic reforms. We identified three main ways of doing this. Fostering trade and financial openness, strengthening local accountability, allowing experimentation at, at the local level, investing in people and in institutions that make better use of the skills that you acquire uh, by going to university, for example. So finally, saying this, these things is easier than getting them done, even though we started with the observation that transition is stuck in many countries in our region and change is hard fought. The basic metric of the report is still hopeful. Time is on the side of the reformers. And when they succeed, they have impact beyond their own countries and the region. The transition experience in Eastern Europe is being closely studied by the countries that went through the Arab awakening in 2011. Tariq Youssef on our panel has been one of the people who has helped me and so many others translate the Eastern European experience and making it relevant for the Arab world. We have seen the energy and inspiration coming out of this exchange of experiences, peer to peer, in our daily business in the countries, but also in a series of events we organize under the general heading of transition to transition. We did though in, in all our con new countries of operation in the southern and eastern Mediterranean. We believe that also in this region, time is on the side of the reformers. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you very much indeed. And you will have a chance to ask some questions in a few minutes. But let's hear from our panel now. Um, Prime Minister Rama, uh, you have presumably come into office full of ambition to push through reforms, uh, full of energy, but what will it really take to, to unstick transition? What does it take? Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, at the same time I feel very grateful to Eric and to uh, the team of EBRD for uh, putting us in the position to be able to start a common program which will basically uh, tackle uh, the problems that were somehow mentioned here. Uh, but to be very brief, I would say that uh, in Albania, as part of the Western Balkans, we live in a very particular moment. Uh, the Western Balkans have always been a place where conflicts and, uh, and uh, battles and fights among each other have characterized the place. And the coming new year, 2014, will be the first new year in the history since Balkans exist that will find us home and no one will be with a gun at the window pointed towards the neighbor. Uh, it's the first uh, new year that practically uh, finds this area without conflict. And what happened uh, was a process of peace that uh, with a certain, with certain uh, uh, speed, uh, but also through many difficulties involved everyone, ending with uh, peace uh, among uh, Albanians uh, 
of Kosovo and Serbs. Uh, and all this has happened uh, in the name of Europe. Uh, everyone has uh, assumed the responsibility to uh, fight for peace and to make peace with the other because of uh, this uh, dream of uh, being integrated uh, in the European Union. But on the other hand, there is a paradoxical situation that this is, all this is happening in a moment that the European Union is not exactly what we had in mind when we uh, started to fight for it. And more we, more we uh, approach it, more we have to deal with a different thing than what we dreamt of. Uh, and uh, I'm very, I'm very, uh, very interested uh, about this report because it's, it underlines uh, something that is always uh, or more or less forgotten during uh, all these efforts to go towards Europe, which has to do with the human capital. More we work and fight for a better future, more we realize that countries at the end are not rich because of what they have, but, but because of what they know. And uh, more we try to understand why the Germans are so better off than us, more we realize that it's all about knowledge. And the, 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 the same pace of, of, of integration, if you see the lane of countries that joined one after the other, and if you see us still on hold, is connected, I think, first and foremost with the uh, knowledge. Uh, and even the data of uh, absorption capacity of every country are again connected with knowledge. So investing in knowledge is uh, a very important, important thing to do, but at the same time, it's more and more difficult uh, for countries that have more and more problems. And so it looks like we have to deal with a very uh, contradictory uh, uh, dilemma. Because uh, when you invest in knowledge, you don't get re-elected. Uh, <laughs> because there, because it, it, needs, it needs a lot of time. At the same time, when you don't invest in knowledge, you may get re-elected, but you have to deal with more and more troubles. So uh, the choice for me is clear. We need and we should invest more on, on the human capital uh, in the whole area. And uh, we need and we should uh, find a way to uh, put ourselves together now uh, and to make of this peace uh, something that should be also a base for an economic development uh, through a regional cooperation. Uh, and I would conclude with, uh, with an episode. Uh, last mm, two weeks ago, I visited uh, Macedonia and uh, I had a press conference with the Prime Minister of uh, Macedonia. And since I watched polit politics in TV, uh, every Prime Minister that has gone to Macedonia, and every prime minister has come from Macedonia in every press conference uh, have promised to build the piece of railway that connects Albanian railway with the Macedonian railway, and never happened. And when I had to go through my my uh, press statement, I found this this phrase: "We will build this," and I didn't say it. And I say the contrary. I said, "Look, I'm supposed to say so, but." I'm not saying so, because I feel watching myself in TV uh, and already uh, being part of a, of a failure. But why I bring it here is that we all need small pieces of railways, small pieces of highways, uh, small pieces of, uh, inter, uh, of interconnection uh, lines for energy, small pieces of 
legislation to connect our, our uh, market uh, spaces. And all this uh, is missing because we are too small and we have too many problems to solve this uh, in our, with our own possibilities, with our own budgets, uh, with, our own, uh, with our own resources. So we, sh we should absolutely come together and advocate for a different type of uh, economic development that should be based much more on a borderless uh, vision and uh, much more on, uh, on uh, thinking about the next generations of our own countries as the next generations of Europeans without waiting really uh, that this would happen once we are in Europe because we risk then on one hand to be out of Europe and on the other hand to have a next generation that will be far from being ready to behave like uh, European Union uh, citizens and not without reasons. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed and uh, you'll have a chance to question the Prime Minister and the other members of the panel in a few minutes. Uh, Rosa Ottenbaeva, I remember a few years ago someone said to me, you were, they described you as the reformer's reformer. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, you have great stamina and reformers have to have stamina because this is a very long battle to keep pushing reform in these countries. Uh, now, that's what you did and you continue to do. Uh, but is it a, a difficult battle? Uh, often reformers find themselves in the minority in these countries as they try to unstick them. It's not always that reformers are in the majority as we see. No, uh, we are not in minority now, we are majority. Uh, after 2000, in yeah, in my country, uh, in, after 2010, we are majority in our country. So, I uh, first of all, uh, Eric, I want to thank you for uh, choosing this topic. Uh, this is what we are very much sick of. We've done everything to uh, the, to implement inclusive policy, and uh, this report came after the book of. Osemo Glow and Robinson, which I bought this summer and I've read and I thought, look, this is exactly what uh, we are thinking every day, every time about. And uh, uh, we have uh, implemented uh, in my country parliamentary democracy, deserted, isolated in our part of the world. And uh, suddenly market economy doesn't correlate so well. And uh, we are really stuck in transition somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, we got now a very big problem with the mining, uh, largest mining um, in, again, probably in our part. Uh, it's one of the five or seven largest mining, 700 tons of gold in Kuntor. And uh, um, government wants to get out from this crisis uh, of a constructive way, but uh, Parliament, which was chosen a democratic way, opposed uh, from to, for this project to keep to going. And so this is really very serious problem which we face these days. So democracy helps um, for openness and uh, uh, for probably rapid uh, movement, but at the same time, uh, democracy stop sometimes your development. So uh, this is um, the problem which we are facing. But uh, I want uh, to rise uh, uh, in my such a, this five minute statement that uh, uh, one of our assets uh, in my country, this is certainly labor force and uh, a country is very young and uh, of, uh, I have in my post-presidency, lonely post-presidency in this part of the world. Uh, I have my foundation and I engage very much with the um, early childhood education. And so when you are talking, Eric, only about the uh, high education, no. Uh, especially poverty grounds in uh, early childhood. And uh, if you will not uh, develop this uh, of, um, age, then you would uh, have uh, a very serious stock of uh, poverty in the social fabric. So, and uh, um, 
uh, this uh, early childhood problem, uh, um, we have 800,000 children up to seven years old in the country where we have 5.7 million population. Uh, country is very young. Uh, we have surplus of uh, labor force. Uh, we are going uh, everywhere, starting from Kazakhstan, Russia, up to the United States. And uh, we are talking about a serious problem of migration. Migration, uh, which is uh, migrants, which are the fourth population in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, we bring uh, to my country, it's about uh, up to one million migrants in the high seasons. It's floating migration, and so they bring one budget uh, um, amount of money to my country. It's uh, a lot of our countries. If you think that uh, uh, Mexico or Philippines are classical uh, migration uh, countries, no, forget about this. Uh, all our countries uh, of Central Asia, South Caucasus, they are beyond 20% of their population are in migration. So I'm wondering uh, if, uh, 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 for example, uh, European uh, for EBRD is such a special bank designed for the de uh, for the promotion of uh, democracy. Article number one, we uh, we remember very well. OSCE, this is uh, the political alliance which uh, uh, looks after the security of all these uh, uh, his uh, constituency countries. Then. Uh, um, and WTO, we are, uh, or we are member since 1998. So all of these international organizations, they allow to move mig migrants uh, uh, around the world. But uh, in fact, it is not uh, for, uh, the reality. And uh, this uh, uh, spring in the OECA where we uh, um, started to think how to design OEC after 20 years uh, of existence, where it should go, this organization. I said, uh, I do believe that uh, you should care about this migration also, because security very much depends from the southern frontier of the OEC. If we are talking about the uh, traffic of drugs, traffic of weapons, whatever, uh, especially after such a scary 2014 then look, uh, migration is a serious problem for my country, for uh, neighboring countries. And of course, uh, neither OEC, uh, no WTO, nobody, uh, no developed world cares about uh, those people. And so we do care. We are very sick of this problem. Uh, in, uh, it brings us a lot of pain, this problem. And so we are talking about the young people, young population. And uh, when you are talking about the human capital, yes, we have a lot of universities. We have um, graduated from the Soviet Union with 10 universities. Today we have 50 universities. But uh, I understood that universities like uh, court system, they don't uh, uh, change. They can't be transferred, uh, transformed. You should just uh, build new universities. This is the case in my country. So uh, with this regard, uh, I do believe that uh, uh, migration is a serious problem. Um, the problem of uh, the business development in our countries, uh, uh, the EBRD is still uh, uh, not up to the very high task uh, to help us to build SMEs. Um, still, you are uh, talking about big uh, credits, big infrastructural projects, and so on. But SMEs, especially bringing microfinancial market up to the banks, this is high agenda in our countries. My country is pioneer of uh, microfinancing in the former Soviet Union, and we have mature market of micro lending and microfinancing. But really, to bring up, to, to help uh, people to build SMEs, this will be very important. And plus, I do believe, Mr. President of this bank, that uh, you are still gender blind. And uh, I would really very much uh, uh, push on uh, the, such a gender-oriented uh, uh, projects in the future. 
So everyone, it's not just a fashion, it is reality gender of agenda. So in this regard, this is very important. And at the end, let me tell you, so this um, kind of report, it is very precious material. Uh, all of us in developing, uh, in this transition countries, we think, why we are living the time of transition? It is so difficult, it's so painful. It is uh, really um, sort of uh, sometimes no perspective uh, where we go, how to uh, overcome this period. Uh, forget about the convergence. Uh, we do not have a European Union to line to. And uh, we have uh, certainly, we live between BRICS countries and so we should benefit from that. But uh, I do believe, uh, Eric, that uh, such a report should be uh, also um, presented in every our countries of uh, the EBRD. And uh, you should come and uh, for, also help us uh, uh, to explain, to discuss and to get feedback about the developments in our countries. Uh, in the uh, audience of students, uh, political, economical establishment, and uh, I do believe this is a very important topic which you have chosen, and I congratulate you with that. Thank you. Rose Rosenbayer, thank you. <laughs> I was just examining the gender balance of our panel here today, actually. <laughs> so, uh, George Soros, you have spent a, a lot of the past few decades championing civil society, championing democracy in some of those countries that might be best described as, as the most stuck. Uh, what's the way out? What's the way forward? <coughs> well, I'm rather hopeful because the situation is so bad that it's liable to improve. Uh, <laughs> and I really mean that seriously when you've got a delegation here from Myanmar where really it was really a hopeless situation and when you really looked hopeless. That's when the change came. So I'm hopeful for this region because the, the region is in fact stuck. Uh, and what had started off as a, as a, a process of integration and a transformation uh, from, let's say, from, it, it was a question of whether uh, the transformation of us from a, a closed society to an open society, uh, that is to say from a repressive regime uh, to a, a, um, a democracy, uh, or from uh, socialism or communism to, um, uh, to, to capitalism. Uh, but in any case, it was a, a, a process of transformation, integration, um, uh, and it has actually uh, now reversed. It, it's a, it, it's a, a process now of disintegration, and, 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 and instead of a convergence to living standards, uh, it's now divergence. And of course, the main, the main source of trouble is in the European Union itself, because one way or another, it, it was clearly a move to try to, to join the West. And the West is in deep trouble, as particularly in the, in, in, in the European Union. And this is the region that desperately needs the, the uh, the European Union uh, as a, a magnet uh, to, which is attracting and it has ceased to function to a large extent. There is still, of course, thanks, uh, 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 good to have the EBRD because it still is an institution working in that direction. And there are other things, I mean, even, uh, even the um, the, the coming Vilnius conf um, um, uh, summit where um, Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova are, are going to be hopefully offered <coughs> some form of association. Uh, and as you could hear from Eddie Rama, uh, that 
the European Union and Europe generally is still an attraction and a magnet for that, uh, that region. And actually, the region has a lot to offer. <coughs> Uh, when you look at the European Union itself, right now uh, um, the Eastern, the new members, are the most constructive politically and even economically relatively uh, um, uh, performing better than the old Europe. The new, new Europe is a very positive contribution to the European Union. So. Um, uh, um, I think you have selected well in having somebody from uh, from uh, Alb Albania who is a real reformer and bringing a new um, uh, beginning, hopefully, in, in Albania. Kyrgyzstan, which is a country uh, deprived of natural resources, uh, but actually the human resources exactly because of that are actually uh, bringing about uh, a quite a rapid uh, economic development. It's a strange thing uh, that Kyrgyzstan is one of the fastest growing uh, countries in the, in the region, but it's all informal uh, um, economy. And the, the, the trouble is that the government is not functioning properly because it has no revenues from, from it because quite correctly, they try not to interfere with the, with the informal uh, role that, that Kyrgyzstan plays, uh, bringing trade between China and the former Soviet Union. So these are good, good, good examples. I, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Georgia deserves um, a special uh, mention because that's the one country well, through a, a strange set of circumstances, uh, uh, you have the most valuable of all uh, democratic institutions, an independent and non-corrupt uh, judicial system. Um, altogether, when we talk about uh, um, political institutions, uh, uh, judiciary, is probably the, the, the most important, and it's the one that is the most lacking or the most deficient uh, in, in this, in, in this uh, region. And it, through a, a, a strange set of circumstances, uh, Georgia has one, because uh, um, the previous president uh, Shakashvili um, um, uh, made uh, corruption a state monopoly, and uh, and <laughs> and therefore created a a judiciary that was genuinely not corrupt, but it was totally dependent on the executive uh, power, the president, the uh, the president. And then he wanted to um, transfer the powers from the presidency to the, to the prime minister, and he was expecting to become the prime minister. But he was challenged and defeated, and therefore you have a judiciary now that is more uh, allied with the previous regime than the current uh, regime. So you now have both an independent and a... Um, uh, a non-corrupt judiciary, which is a great asset. Now, this is an illustration that uh, shows that uh, each country is developing in its own uh, way. And I, I have to uh, express some criticism of the method. Well, you've got the problems of, of methodology and terminology that the the um, report faces. Methodology, which is economics, which is looking for um, uh, common factors, um, um, percentages, whereas the process that is, is, is occurring is by its very nature unique and therefore 
the it's 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 the uniqueness of each in each country uh, that um, um, is more important than the common uh, factors. Now there are a, um, um, and and then you have got the problem of terminology because you call it you still have to call it transition, but transition to what? It's no longer transition. It's unfortunately. You had a revolution, and now you have some kind of restoration. And the restoration is uh, not all that, um, unfortunately, different uh, from the regime that collapsed. So uh, there are reformers, uh, and, and there uh, uh, it's very important uh, to support them. And, uh, and also the emphasis on education is, is, is tremendously important. And uh, um, in, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, you have got the, um, uh, the American University of Central Asia, which is a unique institution of real learning in, a, in an area where it's, it's sadly lacking. And then you've got the, the Central European University, which uh, is very much, uh, uh, I'm the founder. So uh, I think these institutions are playing a very important role. Uh, so I'm, I'm, that's a very good uh, uh, point to emphasize. There's another common ground, which again is well uh, emphasized in the, in the report, and that's the importance of, the, of natural resources. And the, the, the ability to use the natural resources uh, for exploitation and rent seeking. And uh, that's the story of um, the, uh, Russia and, uh, and a number of the other countries uh, in, in the region. So these are the common grounds. Um, but as I say, uh, the, uh, the country, the region is in, in, in badly in need of, 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 of the European Union, and the European Union has to uh, uh, solve its own uh, problem of uh, divergence. Well, Soros, thank you very much indeed. Um, Tarek Youssef, I remember on several trips to Libya, I mean, it was very evident there in the past that the Gaddafi dictatorship certainly <coughs> strangled economic innovation, strangled economic growth, at least in the private sector. And there really was a trade-off then between democracy and, and economic uh, structures. Gaddafi strangled everything. <laughs> uh, Libya today, uh, as it was on the eve of the revolution has virtually no private sector whatsoever. Uh, and I think Libya in, in that regard fits within a larger framework of private sectors in the region that had grown too dependent on the, the sitting despot, on their connections and access uh, to monopolies, to privileges, and it's precisely because of those conditions that the Arab Spring needed to happen. If you take a look at this report, uh, and I read it, and I read it with a with a measure of uh, of, uh, of uh, strong interest, and uh, was immensely reassured by a lot of the important findings that come out of this report. Uh, the first of which related to your question is this notion that uh, if you want to achieve the growth and prosperity that is associated with market-based, socially equitable processes of development, then you will need economic reforms. That was, that was a set of beliefs even prior to the Arab Spring that was held by many observers. Uh, for it to be so well articulated, projected through the prism of transition countries, which I think are 
very, very relevant for how we think about what's happening in the region at the moment, I thought was incredibly reassuring. To get those economic reforms, as the report goes on to suggest, you need the political reforms. And I think this is where our region, for three, four decades, was stuck. There was no prospect of political reform, so economic reforms had limits, inherent limits. Comes the Arab Spring, and I think this is when this report as provides in many ways a blueprint for looking at the transition countries in the past, but thinking about our region and the dynamics over the next few years. You would think that you would get the political reforms. You need to get enough traction, momentum, to be able to tackle the business of economic opportunity, economic reforms, competition, rule of law, etc., etc. But I think the message in the report that perhaps resonated the most with me and uh, in many ways kept me stuck in the first initial chapters as opposed to thinking ab about the story over a 10, 15, 20 year horizon is this notion of transitions possibly getting stuck. I think I may have accepted the invitation to come and be a part of this panel solely based on the title of this report stalled transitions. After all, this is what we see right before our very eyes in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen, in Jordan, in Morocco. One could go so far as to say that we're not just looking at stalled transitions, we're perhaps looking at very significant reversals happening very soon as we have just witnessed in Egypt. So stalled transitions, becomes a very important prism and an instrument through which I think we can talk about the Arab world, talk about progress. And uh, in my view, and I'll be very brief here, our region is stuck on step one. We haven't gotten past the first initial phase of the transition. Two, three years ago, we sort of were thinking already about the long-term process of reform market-oriented, globalization, integration, we're going to have it all. So the five-year scenario became, became the prism <coughs> through which we had debates and discussed the issues. And most of the initial reports talked about the long-term vision. So we took for granted the issue of short-term dislocation, getting past the initial steps. Three years later, we found ourselves now stuck in step one with the prospect of step one, uh, us being in it for a very long time to come. And I think this notion of stalled transition resonates incredibly well with present conditions of transition in the Arab world. At the heart of why we're stuck, and perhaps the report could do more of, of, uh, of analysis, certainly more in terms of looking at past experience in the transition countries to help our region think through this. We're stuck at step one because of unexpected and very, very dangerous emergence of societal polarization that we see in almost each and every one of the countries I had mentioned. Polarization along religious lines, along ethnic lines, along regional lines, polarization with regards to basic issues such as the role of religion in public life or religious parties in the political process. Polarization on things that I never thought in my lifetime this region, our region will be discussing or struggling with, the limits on the use of violence to settle political differences. These are uh, a set of challenges we face now on the first step of the transition. Unless we think of, come up with vehicles, instruments, uh, engagements and frameworks that would allow us to get past them, we will not have the political reforms we need. And as a result, there will be no economic reforms and the stalled transition or the trap of a very low growth, low development, low prosperity transition might persist across the region with the consequence that, in fact, even these revolutions could be reversed. And as George rightly mentioned, you will have the restoration 
of the old regimes with new faces, but with the very first uh, instruments of power. I think these are some of the reflections on this report that I took away uh, or I brought with me as I, as I read it. Uh, I would go so far as to say that of all the reports put out on the transition in the Arab world in the last two to three years, this report is possibly the most useful, even though it's not really written about the region. It is the most useful in terms of relevance to the key questions of the moment, in terms of drawing on past experience from elsewhere, in terms of focusing the attention on the links between the various processes. Perhaps what EBRD can help us with, and where we, I think, got off on the wrong start in the very first place, we did not have an anchoring process such as the prospect of accession to the European Union or even an association agreement with countries that would in fact provide the right incentives for the adoption of political and economic reforms. That's not going to change. But what else can be developed? What other frameworks that would allow for perhaps the prospect of support, of engagement by the outside world to help think through these difficult questions, to help get us outside of the trap. After all, it is my uh, firm conviction that uh, we are today stuck in the first stage of our transition because the outside world looked the other way, did not engage, and allowed us to become victims of uh, an immense level of polarization that very quickly became uh, the the prism and the modality for uh, approaching most of the critical questions. Could EBRD perhaps provide that leadership? I think they've taken the first steps, not only with their engagement with this country, but this sort of report, and I would agree with you fully, this needs to be taken to the countries in question. This needs to be discussed in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya, and Morocco, adapted to the local context. And uh, after all, I think many elements of it provide the right blueprint for at least beginning to organize our thinking now to hopefully get past uh, the position we're stuck in at the moment, which is step one of a transition that's already taking us three years and cost us a lot. Tarek, thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> We do have about five minutes for questions, and then we will have to call it a day. Um, if you could put up your hand and, uh, and ask your question, say who you are, and uh, I'll take two or three questions at once, uh, and then we'll ask our panel to respond. Yes? Uh, just been brought up to the BBC. I'd like to ask George Soros, to what extent do you think um, economic uh, policies in the European Union are hampering the efforts of reform? Because it seems to me that the uh, we'll come to that question in a minute. I'll take two more very quickly, if there are some. Yes. Peter Barker from Xinhua News Agency. I'd just like to ask the members of the panel what they think China could offer to transition nations. Okay. So EU, China, and yes, last question. I'm from, uh, my name is Agri Slauzenex. I'm from Latvia, and I have a question uh, about currencies uh, to Mr. George Soros and Mr. Bergloff. Um, Latvia will be joining Eurozone from uh, January 1st. And um, what are your thoughts about this move? Uh, how this uh, transition will, will have, um, uh, what, what type of impact this transition will have on gross prospects of country? And uh, will Latvia not um, get stuck in, 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 uh, in, in, in um, this, this, this uh, process? Uh, what do you think what will happen and, uh, with, 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 with the country? Let's take the two uh, EU Euro questions first, uh, George Soros. Well, um, um, unfortunately, uh, there, is a, there is a vacuum uh, which is, has been created by the EU failing to perform the function of magnet that it ought to be. It still is working in that direction. You still have the Vilnius uh, summit coming up, and hopefully it won't be derailed. Uh, but uh, it's it's inadequate and it's feeble, and uh, and I think that uh, on the other side, 
the, this region, both the new Europe, generally speaking, with some exceptions, uh, 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 and the, the uh, neighboring countries, are a source of great uh, uh, political and economic uh, prospects for the European Union. So it's a very positive contribution that they have to bring. My specific question was really about economic policies in the European Union. Pan to what extent do you think economic, economic policies being pursued in the, in the European Union are undermining the effort of, of, of reform? Well, unfortunately, that is the case because uh, the, the economic policy that is currently uh, uh, um, being proposed uh, is creating conditions of deflation. Uh, which need to be uh, uh, resisted, and the ECB is determined to do it, but without support from G Germany, it will not be able to do it, uh, because uh, when uh, Asmussen is voting, was uh, voting against the, de the uh, uh, reduction of interest rates, which is the first step, uh, then you can see that there's going to be a lot of uh, resistance from Germany for taking the active monetary steps that the ECB would have to take to, to counteract uh, deflation. Eric Bergloff, does uh, membership of the Euro help transition? Well, I, I, I tell my friends when they start doubting about uh, Europe to go to Warsaw, I think that's where you sense that there's still a role for Europe and where you look at Europe as an opportunity, not uh, as a, something that is a problem. Having said that, I think it played an extremely important role in, in Latvia's case, the way that Latvia managed to get through the, glo the global financial crisis being hit so badly and still managing to restructure its finances to maintain throughout the crisis increasing productivity in industry. I think what we learn from, from Latvia is that you can do these things if you have done the institutional reforms before. It was the, the fact that there was an in investment climate, there was a flexible local um, market uh, in terms of uh, industry and, and labor that allowed these measures to work. I think La for, for Latvia, the Eurozone is just the natural extension of what it is. I don't think it's, it's not going to solve the, you know, the problems for long term for Latvia, it's, but it's going to be part of the solution. And very quickly on China. I mean, China is certainly very interested in Central Asia. Mm. It's very interested actually in the Balkans. I mean, lots of Balkan countries have been uh, in discussions of one sort or another with, with Chinese enterprises. Um, is China a help to transition, Rosa? Yes, it helps. And um, we uh, received uh, from the new uh, leadership of China firm support. And um, uh, you will not find such a long uh, term money for infrastructural projects, and uh, it helps. Prime Minister Rama, will you be interested in Chinese investment uh, in the private sector, for example? A um, few days. Uh Ahead, I have to go with uh, other 15 prime ministers of uh, the area to meet in Bucharest with the Chinese prime minister uh, in the framework of uh, China initiative to invest uh, in these 16 countries of uh, Central Europe and also to uh, sign up a new era of bilateral cooperation with these 16 uh, countries, uh, which includes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trade and also a lot of uh, cooperation, uh, even in the field of education. Uh, so uh, China is showing to be uh, very much uh, willing to have a role and uh, is showing to be more and more interested to participate uh, in the 
in the efforts of these countries uh, towards the future in practically all the areas of uh, the economy and uh, for sure uh, is a very uh, important potential in these troubling times uh, when, at least for our countries, uh, resources are not uh, enough to tackle uh, a, a very, uh, a very uh, complicated uh, crisis, and also uh, new uh, sources of uh, growth are not uh, very obvious to be identified. Yes, a very quick comment. Uh, we will take this report to, to different countries or countries' operation. We will also take it to, to China. China. The Chinese themselves are translating the transition report now every year. And um, it's one of the discussions that I look forward to the most. Of course, if you look at China using this prism of the transition report, China has not done you know, a lot of political reforms and not actually not a lot of the economic reforms. You look at, for example, the financial sector in China, it has a lot left to do to really establish um, uh, something that is a sort of self-sustainable financial sector. But what's so interesting about China, and that goes to what George Soros was saying, you know, when you are in China, it's not too clear what the end zone is. I mean, it's, it raises all kinds of questions of, you know, what type of uh, market economy, you know, what type of uh, political framework are you going to have? And I think that's what we, the kind of discussions that hopefully this report can, can bring about. Eric, thank you. And I'm going to give the last word actually to Jeremy, who's been sitting quietly on the end, because <laughs> Jeremy has been so active in this report in, uh, in, in the research work. Jeremy, a lot of people obviously, you know, if you listen to this in isolation, it can sound a bit gloomy. But is there something we should take away from here today that gives us some grounds for optimism? Yes, I mean, I, I think there are basically three things that give us ground for optimism. First, we, we do show there's a very strong link between political development, democracy, uh, and uh, economic reform. Um, and we also show that, you know, as economic development progresses, the circumstances for democratization improve. They just do it very gradually, it's a decades long process, it's not an immediate process. We also show that over and above the impact of economic development, reform, market reform can have an impact because it affects the strength, or rather reduces the strength of uh, groups in society, vested interests that are opposed to democratization. So that's one uh, hopeful uh, message. The second hopeful message is we show that there are some things over and above democratic reforms that can strengthen uh, economic institutions, and Eric has pointed to, to a number of them, including the role of international integration. And, and finally, and this is something that perhaps did not uh, come out uh, very much in the, in the presentation or in the discussion, we show that even small changes in democracy, what we call critical junctures, can have sometimes very big impacts on economic developments. And we highlight two of those. Uh, the uh, Rose Revolution in Georgia and what happened in Slovakia at the end of the 1990s. And by the way, we do it in a case study methodology that does not have the pitfalls of, of just running regressions, which, you know, arguably we do too much uh, in this in report. But that's not the only thing uh, we do. The problem is it doesn't always work. Uh, and, and so the question is why does it sometimes work? Why do societies take advantage of these critical junctures? Uh, and, and why do they not? We have some analysis of this, but the reassuring thing is that, again, the evidence points to the extent uh, that these critical junctures are externally supported. <coughs> Slovakia was externally supported through the prospect of EU accession. Georgia was massively externally supported, including uh, by societies, uh, by, by foundations like the Open Society Foundation. Uh, and, and so, again, it, 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 uh, it, it strengthens the main message of the report. And, it's, by the way, it also shows that, that leadership matters, uh, which I guess it is good news for Prime Minister uh, Rama. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, it's good to end on an optimistic note. Our panel, thank you very much for taking part today. And thank you very much as well. Thank you. Thank you.